Welcome to the SVG TV News for Tuesday, November 21st. I am Khalil Cato with the details this evening. The Prime Minister, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, has dismissed the notion that St. Vincent and the Grenadines signing on to the EU Samoa Agreement does not mean that the, I the island has committed to any provisions that requires legislative modifications pertaining to abortion, same-sex marriages, or transgender rights. SVG's ambassador to SVG, Andrea Bowman, signed the agreement on behalf of, the, of SVG in Samoa last Wednesday. The agreement is expected to serve as an overarching legal framework for the relations between the European Union and the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States. For the next, for the next 20 years, replacing the Cotonou Agreement, covering subjects such as sustainable development and growth, human rights and peace and security. On Monday, Prime Minister Gonzalez said critics have made exaggerated assertions on the contents of the agreement signed by SVG and other nations from Africa, the Caribbean, the Pacific and the European Union in Samoa. The European Union has its own agenda with several things as is well known. Um, St. Vincent and Grenadines hasn't signed on to any matter which demands of us that we alter our legislative provisions relating to issues such as same-sex marriages, issues regarding um, transgender, there is no commitment for us to change our laws in relation to, to any of these matters. Indeed, there is, there is a question which is before the court. Um, and the court will make its determination as to whether there should be a that the provision in the criminal code which criminalizes homosexual conduct whether that is unconstitutional or not and we the government is insisting in the criminal in the courts that it is not unconstitutional and that in any event, the court ought not to be the, uh, the body which to adjudicate that, but the parliament should be dealing with that particular matter. And those arguments are being canvassed um, in the law courts. I would like someone to point out to me where are the specific provisions in relation to the overall agreement of some 400 pages um, where some of the more outlandish commentaries that I've seen, where they represented in those terms in the agreement. But I assure everybody that St. Vincent and the Grenadines, in its interface with other countries, we always respect other countries' views and the like, but we have our own um, determinations on, on, on particular matters. And in Prime Minister Gonzalez noted that any alteration to SVG's existing laws have to be made by Parliament. There is an issue concerning the matter of the, as I repeat, the constitutionality of the criminalization of homosexual activity. Well, that is winding its way um, through the court and the government is defending the existing legislation that we have. We don't know what would be the outcome. We know that in other jurisdictions in the region, there, has been, there have been rulings that these provisions, similar provisions in our law are unconstitutional. But we'd like to see these matters tested at the higher levels. You know, I don't know what is going to happen at the high court level. That matter is still ongoing. So I, I just urge everybody just to calm down and not to, um, to take some um, prelates position out of Trinidad or out of the United States or somewhere else in a general condemnation of an agreement unless somebody can point to me the specific provisions which they're making the claim that were subversive somehow of um, what we know traditionally as Christian morality. Noting that the EU Samoa Agreement is a comprehensive one, PM Gonzalez said it is intended with in its salient aspects, which touches and concerning SVG to advance inclusiveness within the parameters involving issues of human rights, 
gender equality, special consideration for women and girls, the young people, and the elderly, and advised persons to read the agreement in its totality. And Prime Minister Gonzales has again urged under-documented Nigerians living in SVG to regularize their status. The Prime Minister, who made the, first, who made the appeal first during his recent visit to Nigeria, reiterated the appeal at a news conference here yesterday, noting that some of the Nigerians, which are about 200, who came here in 2017 from All Saints University in Dominica after the devastation of Hurricane Maria, are involved in good and useful work in the country. China, Steen. Would it be upon a country that we round up 200 young Africans and send them home? Chat up, send them home. You, 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 anybody thinks that that is sensible public policy? Because the, the challenge, how are you going to get, if even they have the, the, the money to go home, how many of them can get the visas, the transit visas now, through U.S. or through Britain? So that's an additional problem. But hear me on this. They're productive. We haven't paid for their primary education. We haven't paid for their secondary education. We haven't paid for any of their university education. They're a resource. They are a resource which this country can benefit on. The resource being manpower. Young, educated manpower. Just like the output from our education revolution. Some of them have skills which we need. So why don't we have them regularized? Apply for your residency permit. Apply for your work permit, even though you're doing own account work. You can do that. Those who are married to Vincentians, and there are some of them married to Vincentians, they will be subject when they make the application to the usual inquiries. Is the marriage of, uh, for example, a marriage of convenience? <laughs> eh? And I'm quite sure. In, in the same way we do it with, 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 with other people who, got, who get married to Vincentians. That's one of the questions which has to be asked. And 99.9999% of them are not marriages of convenience. It's only very rarely you find one, or you find the evidence for one. And do you want persons to be living in the shadows, young people, people who are the, of the same ancestry as the vast majority of Vincentia? Do, 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 we, do we want to have them living in the shadows and to have employers exploit them? And other people exploit them for other purposes? Absolutely not. So let them be regularized. Prime Minister Gonzales rubbished claims that he is encouraging the Nigerians to regularize their status for their votes in the upcoming general election. Heavenly Father, you have 200 people, you have 300 people. They live in from down South Leeward in Camden Park to Mespo. So you're in South Leeward, East, West, Central, East Kingston, West St. George, East St. George, like Marco, that is eight constituencies. They could make a difference in any election. I mean, it's just... But I pose this question. If they were Canadians or Americans or British, would those people have reacted in the same way? Or are they reacting because they're Africans? They must examine their souls to see that. So I, I pose that question. Now, the false analogy is presented that I'm doing this whereas when Mr. Yusa had said to give honorary citizenship to Garifuna, as he said, 800,000 Garifuna. Remember that? They said that's the number which they said. I think they exaggerated the number with the gentleman who had come from. Remember there was once, there was a, a Dr. Ramos, Wellington Ramos. There was some the, 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 the NDP and its people went into some convulsions on this thing with Ramos, thinking they had a winning, a winning card. Well, first of all, if you have Garifuna people, brothers and sisters from, from Honduras, for instance, to come here, if they're here already like the Nike, and they, they're in a similar position going to university and all the rest, I will make the same point. Let them be regularized. I'll make precisely the same point. But I come as I did, I come now as I did then. When you give something called honorary citizenship, which is not known to the Constitution. Member of Parliament for East Kingstown, Fitzgerald Bramble, told the young people at the NDP Youth Rally in Camden Park last Saturday night that they have been experiencing a decade of despair and it is time for hope. For most of you out there, for most of you young people, all of your lives almost, you have only known the ULP. In your parents' time, when they were about your age, 
Unemployment was low. Poverty was low. Crime rate was low. The murder rate was almost non-existent. So for those of you in your 40s and under, your parents, during the time of the New Democratic Party, that was the St. Vincent and the Grenadines that they knew. The society that they enjoyed. Let me fast forward to now and talk about the last decade, the last 10 years. For many of you, that is more than half of your lives. Never in the history of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have we had so many of our young people out of school, at home, and on the streets with nothing to do. Never before in the history of this country. 42% of our young people are unemployed. Never in the history of this country have we had so many people living in extreme poverty. Listen to this. Almost 42, 43% of our people are living on $14 and less per day. Let that sink in. $14 and less per day. Almost half of our population living on that. I ain't making up these numbers, you know. And that is why they can't doubt me when I make these, these observations and these comments. Today, today, our young people are leaving St. Vincent and the Grenadines by the hundreds to find opportunities in other countries. Noting that the country has experienced two consecutive record-breaking years for crime, the opposition MP said the country's national debt is also of concern, as well as the unemployment level. Not to mention underemployment. Just ask all of those people on the SET program with their university degrees, making a thousand dollars a month. They could never be happy. They can't be happy. How do you think they would feel? And it is true to say that we have been a nation without hope. We have been a nation in despair. All we are hearing from the ULP is promises, promises, and more promises which they have failed to deliver. And the evidence of success of the Unity Labour Party is a deeply divided St. Vincent and the Grenadines. That is what they have to brag about for their success. That is the centerpiece of their success. Over and over again, the government has been failing, and now they want us to believe that failure is success. They want us to believe that this is the best our country can do. This is the best for our young people. This is the best our young people can hope for. The and the, the concert was held under the theme, Let's Get It Done. The impact of global events over the last three and a half years is clear, and the Caribbean Development Bank is working to address these challenges by steadily increasing its support to borrowing member countries. This is according to President of the CDB, Dr. Hygienius Jean Leon, who, while addressing the opening of the inaugural United Kingdom UK Caribbean Infrastructure Conference virtually, said although the borrowing member countries have demonstrated some fortitude, the vulnerability and low resilience capacity have limited progress towards the attainment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In 2022, total disbursements increased by 12.2% to $286 million U.S. dollars, comprising $181 million U.S. dollars in loans and $105 million in grants. This could not have been possible without our valuable partnership with the government of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland and every government within the UK CIF portfolio. Ladies and gentlemen, this partnership we speak of is instrumental to building resilient prosperity in our BMCs. Why? Because it has facilitated the delivery of development projects that have transformed the lives and livelihoods of our people in a way that neither the bank, the governments, nor the private sector could have implemented and completed alone. Minister Mitchell, resilient prosperity requires continued investment. It is imperative, therefore, 
that the UKSIF program, which ends in March of 2026, is renewed. Due to the impact of climate change on the vulnerable Caribbean countries, the UK Minister of State, of State for Development, Andrew Mitchell, said that they, will have inv they have invested heavily in climate resilience infrastructure through the UK Caribbean Infrastructure Fund. This fund is enabling 13 transformational infrastructure projects to be built in the region, driving inclusive economic and social development and increasing resilience to the future shocks and challenges that climate change will bring. The fund's projects are crucial, yet much more needs to be done. We need to build on its foundations to achieve more and better development. Reflecting on and learning from our experiences helps us improve. You only have to watch the game of cricket to know this. Much success in the sport is reliant on avoiding past mistakes and patterns, the same lessons apply to us. What bounces has our infrastructure fund delivered and what have we learned from them? How can we read the ball to see what is coming so we are prepared for it? The lessons and good practice you discuss over the coming five days will improve the delivery of your current and future projects and equip you to achieve more for your countries. I am delighted that officials from Britain's Infrastructure and Projects Authority and British Standards Institute will join you to share our experience in infrastructure delivery and improving standards and regulations in the sector. The inaugural UK Caribbean Infrastructure Conference is being held under the theme Building Resilience for All. More than 50 delegates from eight Caribbean countries and one UK overseas territory are participating in the week-long conference, focusing on capturing vulnerable lessons from the 13 transformational infrastructure projects being implemented under the UK Caribbean Infrastructure Fund, UKCIF. Participants are expected to discuss the successes and lessons learned while designing and building inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable infrastructure in the region. They will also benefit from capacity building sessions being delivered by IPA, the UK's Infrastructure and Projects Authority, and BSI, British Standards Institute, on regulations, standards and best practice approaches to deliver climate resilient infrastructure. The <music> League Council for the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Teachers Union, in its case against the government, Jomo Thomas, promises the dismissed teachers that by January 2024, they will be celebrating again when the appeal lodged by the government is squashed. In March 2023, dismissed teachers won the case brought against the government, challenging the vaccine mandate in the High Court. Justice Esco Henry ruled that the government's COVID-19 vaccine mandate and the termination of the teachers were unlawful, unconstitutional, ultra-virus, disp disproportionate and tainted by procedural impropriety. At the teachers' rally last Friday in Kingstown to end the Teachers' Solidarity Week, Thomas said, come January next year, the court will once again vindicate the dismissed teachers and they will be paid what is owed to them. We have convinced as well that a court of appeal would agree with Justice Henry that the mandates were unconstitutional. We believe, we are convinced that a court of appeal would agree with Justice Henry, as we argue that the Public Service Commission and the Police Service Commission responded slavishly to the mandate of the ministers and simply carried out what the minister said rather than address their mind to the serious issues which were raised because that is the peculiar constitutional responsibility of the Public Service Commission and the Public Service Commission. So, on these fundamental pillars, we believe that the court is going to agree with us, sustain Justice Henry's argument, and conclude that the government wronged public workers by dismissing them. And all of you who are out for all of these months, I expect you to get your monies, I expect you to get your benefits, and I expect you to move forward as teachers and as public workers triumphantly to serve the children and the people of St. Vincent and the Grand. 
On November 18, 2021, the mandate under the Public Health Rules 2021 came into effect for frontline workers, including teachers, nurses, other healthcare workers, police and workers at the ports of entry throughout the country. Thomas further added that the union knew the mandate was unconstitutional and that the government wronged public sector workers by dismissing them. The teachers union, the public service union and the police welfare association came to our chambers. Thomas and Bango. And we believed then as we believe now that you had a very good case. We thought that the government's mandate and demands were unconstitutional, were ultra-virus, were unlawful, and were procedurally improper. And that was the case which we brought before the court. And that case was argued, and you may recall, on March 13th of this year, Justice Henry, that lion-hearted jurist came back and said, yes, I agree with the unions. These mandates are unlawful, unconstitutional, ultra-virus, and procedurally improper. And before the decision was given any air at all, the government said that it would appeal, and it has appealed. It has appealed, and the appeal has worked its way through the courts. The matter is at the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal, a timeline was given for the submissions. The government lawyers were told that they must present their case of appeal by October 19th. They did that, and we were told that we have to answer their case by November 3rd, and we have done that. Justice Henry had ruled that none of the workers ceased to be entitled to hold their respective offices, and that the dismissed workers were entitled to full pay and all benefits, inclusive of any accrued, any accrued pension and gratuity benefits from the dates that they were deemed to have been to have resigned. Following the ruling, the defendants, the Minister of Health and the Environment, the Public Service Commission, the Commissioner of Police, the Attorney General, and the Police Service Commission quickly filed an appeal and applied for a stay of execution of the judgment. The behavioral issues coming from some schools in SVG include cyberbullying, illegal drugs, and offensive weapons. This is according to Senior Education Officer Elspeth Adams, who spoke on the complaints and behavioral issues faced by teachers, principals, and security officers at schools on the Police Beat program on NBC Radio. Adams noted that the complaints coming from the schools can be many and varied, while coordinator of the National Reconciliation Unit, Deborah Michael, emphasized that, that at present, there is an overall decrease in people's regard for one another. Pornography, illegal drugs, offensive weapons. We have issues of truancy. We have uh, issues of uh, parents being absent from the life of their, their child, their children. So like I said, the issues that we face generally on a daily basis are many and varied. Well, I think one of the biggest things that, uh, the, the most noticeable things that we've seen is, is just the, the general decline in lack of respect for each other in, in all ways and forms. And that's manifesting itself in the school, it's manifesting itself at home. A lot of parents are just saying, well, I can't go with the child, that sort of thing. Um, so in, in terms of it, it's just a lack of respect just amongst our citizens in general. That, that seems to be something that is lacking everywhere. Michael said that in this era of social media, persons have to be careful what they post and how it can affect others. What is happening? I mean, social media, you, you touched on it. Um, basically, anybody goes on social media and, you know, you just post without consideration for how it affects um, individuals and organizations. So to the point now where some persons are even reluctant to, to make public appearances mm -hmm. and stuff because... They, they feel that, you know, it, it opens them to that sort of bullying. Um, I don't know if um, 
SEO Adams um, would recall like recently with the, the public speaking competition, um, some of the students, clips were made of them and they were basically posted and people were was like, you know, poking fun at them. And these are people who um, would have worked hard to go and represent their schools. And, you know, sometimes you put on the spot and you may have a little stumble or something. And, you know, society is very unforgiving these days. And it is, you know, an opportunity for people to just go and, you know, basically cyber bully them. Senior Education Officer Adams outlined some of the steps being taken by the Ministry of Education to confront the issues in schools. The school's curriculum is usually tailored towards assisting with these kinds of problems. So in most schools, health and family life education is, is taught. In that particular subject area, you would have uh, subtopics like conflict resolution, you may have uh, subtopics like negotiating, etc. In some schools, life skills are taught. So students get an idea at the school level based on the curriculum as to how to deal with some of, of these issues. Um, we also have the situation where our teachers are expected to be engaged in pastoral care mm -hmm. daily. Mm -hmm. So they're expected to provide social, emotional, and in some cases, spiritual support for these students. We try from the ministry's level to point our students to extracurricular activities. So there are quite a bit of sporting activities. Some of our students are involved in scouts, Girl guides, brownies. We are also encouraging our students to become a part of the police youth club, the Pan Against Crime Initiative, since all of these were created in an effort to curb the crime situation here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Director of the Consumer Affairs Division, Clarence Harry, said the objective of the Consumer Protection Act 2020 is to provide full promotion and protection of customers of consumers' interests regarding goods and services to ensure protection of life, health and safety, health and safety of all consumers. Speaking on the matter ahead of the Christmas season on NBC Radio's Talk Your Talk program today, Harry said under the Act there are eight fundamental rights as consumers including the right to safety. So we're excited. So why, why, why are we so excited? Consumer protection is real. It is alive and is here to protect our consumers. So we are buzzing. Mm -hmm. And later on in the program, you will hear what we have been doing thus far and the plans we have going forward to make sure our consumers are educated and empowered to make better and wiser decisions. Two, the right to be, to be informed, the right to choose, the right to be heard, the right to representation, the right to address consumer education, and the right to a healthy environment. But while you have rights, you must be responsible. So in that same vein, the consumers in the same breath but be mindful of these five basic responsibilities. All of us have to keep close to our hearts. One, to be informed, to choose carefully, and this is important and fundamental, to be reasonable, to report unethical behavior, and most of all, to be honest. And those, because the rights are not exclusive of responsibilities, they go together, right. they're twins. So one can't exist without the other. Senior Consumer Officer Colin Oliver, who was also on the program, said there is a large number of people in SVG who are unaware of their fundamental rights as consumers. There is a mechanism for redress. So in a case where some operators are unscrupulous, we live in the real world, mm -hmm. and they sometimes take advantage of, of um, consumers. But I've often said, an empowered consumer is an informed consumer. Right. So you know your rights. I mean, you would operate, you treat me differently. It's, it's clearly. If I come to you, you know, not looking very informed and know my way around you, 
Step and send push me around and you know give me the one around. But once I'm informed and empowered, you treat me differently. So when it comes up for our consumers to get information to make yourself empowered to make better and wiser decisions. Yeah, I, I think as well to to extend the point that that the director is making. As we travel throughout the country, you would be shocked to know the amount of persons who don't even know that they have a fundamental basic rights. And I think this is one of the things that, well, both consumers and suppliers, mm -hmm. and I think this is one of the things that is driving consumer complaint because persons do not understand, they don't know that these rights are there and these rights are there to protect them. And so when they walk into an establishment, make a purchase, the, 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 the clerk, says to them, look, that is the end of it. There's nothing you can do. And some of them just walk away because they don't understand. They don't know that they have these rights. They have power in which they can seek redress, compensation. And so that is one of the things that, that we have been zeroing on, consumer education throughout St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Consumer Affairs Division Director stressed that one of the obligations of suppliers under the Consumer Rights Act is to have their products labeled in English. Then the whole issue of displaying of prices, it is fundamental. Because sometimes you go to a to market to do a book or something, the prices are not there. Or even if the price is there, you might have a price, a low price here on the shelf. And when you go to the cash shop, it's a different price. It's a different price. The law says you pay the lower of the prices. Then they have a responsibility to make sure that both are labeled. Then the disclosure of recondition going sometimes the sellers go to the recondition, we don't know. The law says you ought to tell the consumer. Correct. I'm selling you a used or reconditioned item. And also the issue of um warranties. So it's a big it's a big thing. Yes. And now it's Christmas. Yes. Mm -hmm. And extended warranties, etc. Well, extended warranties is, is an extra service you pay for. Right. But the basic six month warranty, the supplier ought to tell the consumer that these items are under warranty. The Consumer Protection Act 2020 provides for the promotion and protection of consumers' interests in relation to the supply of goods and services. It ensures protection of life, health, and safety of consumers, provides for the establishment of a department responsible for consumer affairs and connected purposes. One of its key offerings is the establishment of a consumer affairs department, which gives legal teeth to bring justice to deserving consumers.